Edna St. Vincent Millay, maybe you've heard that name, died in 1950. She was an agnostic, an unbeliever, and she was also a poet. Her words were sometimes sharp and sarcastic, but in one of her poems, published after her death, it is evident that she understood God's problem better than most Christians do, maybe. Most people do. And it was translated, and some of the points are these. She said, God manipulated matter, heavy, obstinate stuff. It must be stubborn, for sure, she said. But in such hands as God's, it must have been easy and great fun to bend them into shape, to toss a planet here, set off a star up there, and whip it into a galaxy, to fit them in even to concentrate on a little globe and decorate this little globe, the crust of this little globe, with life and greenery. But the trouble God, God got himself into, that's what frustrates me. Remember, she's an agnostic. That's what fronts, the trouble that God got himself into, that's what frustrates me, she said. To fashion a human heart and mind, then set it free and turn it loose on its own and watch it go this way and that way and turn out so botched up and rebellious. Then to try to win us back again to what he meant us for. To read our hearts as they are now layers upon layers of wrongful thoughts and wrongful acts pressed together like leaves pressed into coal. Then try to disentangle without forcing us to, under, to understand all that without hating us. To punish our wrongs without destroying us and still to keep trying and to persuade us out of the kind of wickedness that we have chosen to get into. That's real trouble, she concludes. Not a trouble to create the galaxies, but this is the real trouble. I can't understand why he botched that up in the first place or why they even bothered with it. I don't understand for a moment how anything much can come of it but how I respect him for daring to try. Wow. Could a believer have said it better? Except for one thing, that the believer knows that God will yet succeed with enough human hearts to make it worth all the trouble. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to God, but the, things, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And he has revealed them to us through a marvelous plan, which the Bible calls a mystery. And yet he unfolds that mystery to every believer and fills it with meaning and with love. I'd like to begin this morning with two texts of scripture. Paul seems to be overwhelmed with God's solution and his salvation to the problem of sin. Let's look at him. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. I'd like to invite you to follow along with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. It says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And the second one is Galatians 6, verse 14. Off to the right, just a little ways. Galatians 6, verse 14. If you have it, say amen. amen. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. You know, I read someplace that the highest point that we can achieve to in this life, would you like to go there? 
is at the foot of the cross. To Paul, the cross of Christ was one supreme teaching. It was the one supreme teaching, according to the verses we just read. And we should not consider that he is overemphasizing this to the inclusion of any other teaching, but the teaching is the centerpiece of it all. We have often exhorted, been exhorted to a much closer study of the meaning of the cross. Our sermon title this morning is In Search of the Cross. Each of us are on a personal journey. Today I want to examine with you the meaning of righteousness and sin in the light of the cross. God's solution to it. Righteousness is, is defined by God's law. There's a text I would like us to turn to, and it'll be kind of a, I'd like to have you keep it kind of in the back of your minds while we're, while we're talking this morning. It's Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. John sees a vision, in vision, sees the great temple in heaven, and he sees in the temple the ark. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. Is there a temple in heaven, by the way? <laughs> okay. The book of Hebrews is all about that, isn't it? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Revelation is a sanctuary book. It's mentioned time after time in the book of Revelation. I don't believe that you can even begin to, to touch what the book of Revelation is trying to tell us without understanding something about the sanctuary in heaven where Jesus is now our high priest. We're living in a time of earth's history when this text about the temple of God being opened in heaven has peculiar force. The law of God was contained in, the, in that ark and the mercy seat right over, the, right over the, the, the law. The principle of Christ's atonement was located just above the law. The principle of Christ's atonement, I say. What does that mean? The principle is mercy. He had great love for us or we wouldn't have done what he did. Mercy and more of it to save us. The law defines sin, 1 John 3, 4. Our sin is God's great problem. And the law of God and the mercy seat must be seen and considered together and they spell out the great, the great prerogatives of justice and mercy. I believe that in the, in the beginning, the devil could not correlate the idea of justice and mercy. But as he dies on the cross, justice is satisfied, right? For a whole world of people, 60 centuries of earth people, justice is satisfied. And then as it's, it's as if he's hanging there on the cross and he says to all of us, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you the rest that you need. Wow. Justice and mercy must be seen and considered together. They are the basis for our justification. These Ten Commandments, spoken and written in Mount Sinai, are ten principles of righteousness, which are adopted by God for the needs of humanity, people living on this earth. But the principles are the same, no doubt, throughout the whole universe. The law was in existence before Mount Sinai, before the creation of man. For they are eternal principles of unselfishness, which apply, at least in principle, to the whole universe of God. Let's take a little look at the law, just for briefly. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What is the principle here in this one? The principle is loyalty to God. No other gods before him. The next one says, it's all about idols and images and governs the principles of worship. In Revelation 13, the principle of true worship is violated by an image to the beast. The third commandment has to do with reverence. And the fourth commandment, 
the fourth commandment in a vision that Ellen G. White saw had a halo around it. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath is holy because God is holy. He made the Sabbath holy and only a holy God can put holiness into a day, right? It's a memorial of who he is and what he is like. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. What do you think the principle of Sabbath is? Worship. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. It's a sign of sanctification and holiness in Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20. The principle is holiness. The fifth commandment, honor father and mother. What is the principle? Respect for authority. All authority, whether it's mom and dad, <laughs> mom and dad, or the authorities that govern the land. The sixth one, sacredness for life. Thou shalt not murder. The seventh one, purity. The eighth one, thou shalt not steal, honesty. The ninth commandment is about truthfulness. Thou shalt not bear false witness, right? Truthfulness, that's the principle. It goes into a lot of different areas of life. Even the expression on a face sometimes. The tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet. Here's an interesting one. Really, it sums up the whole law. What is the principle that behind thou shalt not covet? The principle is contentment. Contentment. I would like to have read, read, have us read together Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Not that I speak in respect, in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? Content. Are you contented this morning? In the gospel, we should have perfect contentment, right? I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Contentment. Paul experienced that. So these are the eternal principles behind the law of God. I believe throughout the whole universe. These 10 principles are summarized by one word. You all know what it is, don't you? Love. Love. How does this work? If I love Josh, I'm not going to lie to him, right? If I love David, I'm not going to go to his house at one o'clock in the morning and screw off his, his uh, sprinkler head off of his hose, right? And then sneak away. Honesty. It's the principle of love throughout the universe. You can take all these principles and uh, they are the law of, of universe. It's like the law of gravity. If you drop off the edges, what, what happens? You plummet to the very center of the earth, toward the center of the earth. That's where gravity takes you. You know, I have found uh, that this summary of principles is useful in talking to people who don't study the Bible, haven't studied the Bible much. Maybe some, some of my Bible studies who don't really know about the law of God. I could ask my friends, whenever I get on the subject of the law of God, I ask them if, if any of these principles could be left out. Could this possibly be done away with? What do you think would happen if all this was done away with, these principles of love that we've just read about? You know, none of, none of them would ever say yes. Nobody would live in a society like that, right? They're what God is like. God is love. He's honest. He's truthful. He's reverent. He's pure. God is holy. And he's a God of love. These are principles that codify, codify the very character of God. That's what he's like. 
He'd never lie to you. He always seeks your good. His love is a self-sacrificing, self-renouncing love. These 10 principles are the character of God. They are the characteristics of people who will live in his everlasting kingdom forever. They are the principles of righteousness. Now let's deal with this under, underlying principle of, of, of the whole law, the, that the law is love. Love is not a sentiment. It's not a suggestion. It's not an emotion, although it can cause emotions, right? It's not a policy. It's not a feeling. By the way, what is the difference between a policy and a principle? The law of God is our 10 principles, right? Love is a principle. What's the difference between a policy and a principle? Some of us have worked for other people out there. Policies are based on principles. Pardon me? Policies can be, ba can be based on principle, but policies are subject to change, right? Uh, you work for a company, pretty soon a new owner comes along or, or they've had a change of mind or the board of directors uh, says we're gonna change something here, they change the policy, right? Maybe it has to do with your retirement or whatever it is on that, at that place where you work. Policies can change, but principles never change, they're eternal. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is that comes out of my lips. Psalms 89:34. A principle is eternal. Love is an eternal principle. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, "Love never what, never fails. If I love, I don't fail somebody." So. <clears throat> Like the principle of the law of gravity, the princip a principle acts in a fixed way. Is that right? You drop something and it's pulled toward the center of the earth. That's how the law of gravity operates. Now, how does the principle of love operate? Paul says that love is never selfish in 1 Corinthians 13. Desire of ages. In that chapter, God with us, are these words. It will be seen that the glory shining from the faith of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing, self-renouncing love. That's what love is, self-sacrificing, self-renouncing. In the light that comes from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God who is the very center of everything. It's the law of life for heaven and earth. And when God created the universe, he gave his law of love as a standard of life. Mount of Blessings brings out that before rebellion broke out in heaven, the angels served God not as servants, but as sons. They had no idea that there, were, that there was a law. And then uh, a little further, it says, there is perfect freedom and peace in obedience to God's law. Do you want perfect obedience, perfect peace and perfect freedom? In, in um, James chapter two, it says, it's a law of what? Liberty, perfect liberty. And when controversy broke out in heaven, it is almost as though, an, it came at almost as an overwhelming surprise to the intelligent beings who were the angels, that there even was such a law. They never thought about it, for it was written in their hearts and in their minds. Their lives were in perfect accord with the principle of unselfish love, and, this, and thus no selfish trouble in heaven, only happiness in every life form. But there was a being in heaven known as the covering cherub. This being probably knew more about God and his character than any other being in the whole universe. He was right in the presence of God. He was the covering cherub. He tried to pervert this freedom and happiness and peace. He introduced another principle, which was opposed to the principle of love. 
Great Controversy 493. Sin is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Love is the foundation of the divine government. That's a uh, close quote. And he presented it in a most deceitful and unfavorable light. He insinuated doubts concerning the laws that govern the heavenly beings. Story of Redemption, page 16, says he promised them a new and better government than they had. Close quote. So Satan was the greatest intellect in the universe, outside of God himself. He's called the son of the morning. I don't know exactly what that means, but it might mean that uh, he was uh, maybe the first created being. I don't know what that means. But he was a very special being in the universe and highly respected by all the angels. And it's like Absalom sat in the gate of Jerusalem and he run down David. So this is exactly how Satan operated, Lucifer operated. Sin was never before, never before existed. Deceitfully, he was misrepresenting the one who alone is holy and the source of all life and unselfish and good. The source of all goodness, he was misrepresenting that. The angels didn't uh, perceive the nature of selfishness and sin. To some of them, it may have even appeared attractive. A little more freedom. Would you like a little more freedom? To ponder that is to lose innocence. To ponder that is to lose innocence. Innocence fell in Eden that day, one day. And uh, thoughts were turned inward. That's what the loss of innocence is. Thoughts are turned inward. If you have a little baby, a little, a little young one, not a, not a real little baby, but uh, you know, when they start to crawl around and so forth, and uh, all of a sudden they make some kind of a funny noise and everybody in the room just laughs, right? You know, that baby just lost some innocence. His thoughts have turned inside now, right? Oh, I see if I can do that again. I want people to look at me. So uh, this is kind of how, we, how innocence is lost. And Satan was successful to deceive a third of the angelic host and chose to believe the great liar. Jesus said he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning probably from the beginning of his, of his sin. He had said he was perfect in all of his ways until iniquity was found in him. There was a time when he was a perfect being. Even the angels who continued to follow God did so by faith. For the first time, God's law was questioned. And so the stability of the universe depended upon the freedom, upon the foundation of God's character, I'm sorry, his law. And when the conflict is over and all is laid open, the overwhelming chorus of support will be heard. Let's turn to it. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. This is what it'll be like. This is how the chorus of support for God will be heard. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. I want to hear this song. I want to hear this song one of these days over there. Here's what it says. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of Saints. Don't you want to be there and hear that song, that chorus, from, uh, coming from all the redeemed, the redeemed beings? You know, we have a song in our hymnal. It says, when we, when we tell salvation story, angels hold their wings. For angels never knew the joy that my salvation brings. This will be a joyful thing to spend eternity where everything is wonderful and good. One pulse of harmony then will beat through the vast creation. And the Bible says in Nahum 1.9 that affliction will not rise up to second time. How come? How come? Are we going to be robots or something like that when that time comes? 
How come affliction will not rise up a second time? First of all, God said it. He knows, he knows the end from the beginning. But it'll be seen that the cross is the eternal antidote for sin. Nothing could, could do this except what was done. Even the great God could have not done something better on our behalf. All will declare, oh, how I love thy law, like David said. With one voice, people will say that. That's, a, that's going to be a chorus in heaven. Oh, how I love your law. You remember what David said? Rivers of waters run down my cheeks because they've made void your law. We will still we'll have that kind of a, a attitude toward God and his law. How does this satanic rebellion, rebellion come unraveled and dealt a death blow? It doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. God did something. He had to act in time and place in order to do something that would, uh, that would cause the rebellion to come to an end. God's character would have to be revealed in such a way that it'll never, ever be forgotten. When that takes place, when that took place, do you think there were any doubting among the unfallen angels? No, on the cross, guess what? One pulse of harmony beat through their hearts on that day because they knew that God loved them. Never again would they doubt him. God had a plan. And as we mentioned, even the great God could have not made a better plan. And apparently only one way would be sufficient to create an eternal antidote for sin. Only one thing could do it. God's character was to be revealed in such a way that no one would ever doubt him again. It's found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I've read this text so many times. Just, just musing on it, just contemplating it. Notice what it says. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of what? The gospel of Christ. For it is what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Where is the righteousness of God revealed? In the gospel, right? The gospel is a subject here. So it says, for therein, that is in the law, in the gospel, the law, of the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Wow. So where is the righteousness of God fully revealed? In the gospel, hanging on the, Christ, on the cross, Jesus is the gospel. It's the greatest revelation of God's character that has ever been expressed by God himself to an unfallen universe. Now I want to turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. This is a scene in the judgment in heaven that takes place. The great judgment. The door, remember, was opened into the, into, the, into the sanctuary. And John was invited to come in. And this is what he sees. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. John is, is talking now about what he sees there. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, inside and on the backside, sealed with what? Seven seals. Nobody can get into this thing. <clears throat> I saw a strong angel. Proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. One translation says, I, I wept profusely. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look therein. It was... The custom of the priests in the Old Testament to open the scroll which contained the law of Jehovah. Many people weren't able to read. And so the priests, the people who took care of the sanctuary, often would stand and they'd read the law to the people. 
What kind of a law is it again? Law of love, <laughs> okay. Law of freedom, right? People love to hear that. And to look on it and to read it before the people. So the priests were chosen to reveal these things. They were the great expounders of God's law in ancient times. But here in Revelation, near the close of human probation, in the judgment in heaven, in the presence of 10,000s times 10,000s and thousands of thousands of angels, as it mentions in Revelation 5, in their presence, in the investigative judgment, in the presence of the representatives of this world, 24 elders, our great high priest, who is also on this, on this earth with us as a lamb in the midst of the throne there in, in, that, in, that, in that scene. And no one was able to qualify to open that scroll. It seemed to John that no one in the whole assembly could open the scroll and explain its contents. And John realized that this was, maybe it's all a lost cause. Nobody can do this. Nobody could be found. Unless somebody could be found, Wow, he wept sorely about it. You remember the Philistines stole the ark containing God's law at one point. They, they quickly got rid of that, didn't they? It was a very unhappy experience. and It was soon sent back. And when the children of Israel got, got it back, they rejoiced. They opened it up and looked inside, and 50,000 plus 70 were perished as a result of that. God's law is as sacred as himself. And what is it? It's a law of what? Love. Has God de de dealt fairly with the whole universe, with the angels that fell, with all of us, with the unfallen universe? Has God dealt fairly with them? Remember, God is a God of love and truth. God's law is as sacred as himself. Now here was Satan challenging God's law, which is a transcript of the character of God. The universe is in jeopardy because Satan has challenged God. Indeed, in Isaiah 14, he wants to be God. To challenge God's character is to challenge God's throne. One of the thrones sits on two pillars, justice and mercy. And in order to understand a perfect love, you have to understand something about justice and mercy both being blended, right? It forms the rainbow that covers the throne of God. None of God's creatures could appreciate the length and breadth and depth of the, and the wisdom of the love of God, which is considered in his law, the basis of life for the universe. And man was deceived and darkened by Satan and wonder of wonders, we all joined in the rebellion. Now, Revelation 5, verse 5. We're in Revelation 5, right? Verse 5. And one of the elders says to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has prevailed to open the book to loose the seven seals thereof. Who would that be? Jesus. This is Jesus. He prevailed to open the book. He's the lamb here in this scene in the midst of the throne. He represents the cross. The only one in heaven and earth who could open the book of God's character. Let's notice verse 6. I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. What is that? In the most holy place of the sanctuary. What is that? That's the cross. The cross is there too, isn't it? In that book is faithfully, faithfully recorded how God has lovingly, unselfishly revealed the character of God. It was a result of a painful process. But on the cross is a full revelation of the character of God. Self-sacrificing, self-renouncing love. 
how he has dealt with every rational being from day one of the controversy on down through the centuries and through the centuries and through the millennia. In that book is how God has fairly treated every individual that is rational, everyone. What an idea. What was the response of these beings that uh, are around the throne in the judgment scene when full revelation is revealed? Let's look at it, verses 9 to 14. We're in chapter 5, right? Revelation chapter 5. You're all there? Let's notice how they react when they, when, the, when they see what's in there, what's in that sealed book. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and have made us to, made us to our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign in the, on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and of the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. They're all gathered around as this book. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory, power to be to him that sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that, there, that lives forever and ever. And when you get to chapter 11, it says they fell on their faces and worshiped him. In that sealed book is the answer. And it's pretty important. These, these beings see the big picture now. It's only the sinful heart of man that refuses to look in this book and, and figure out what, what God has done for us. And what is our response as the principle of the cross is unfolded to our finite minds? What, is our, what do you think our response should be? No wonder. The great apostle could say in Acts 4, verse 12. Let's read it. This was our scripture reading. I don't want to try to quote it because I don't want to, want to uh, distort it in any way. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. No wonder. Here's what it says. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yes, God loves everyone. But you know what? He can't save everyone. My prayer is that our search for the cross will be intense and sincere as we live our lives and depend upon it every day. Spend some time every day Searching the book for the purpose of knowing Jesus, not to win some argument with somebody, but for the purpose of knowing Jesus and seeing his character, it'll melt our hearts. We need to do that every day. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work and spend some time learning to know Jesus. Whom to know is eternal life. May it be so with us here this morning. Church is full today. What a wonderful sight. You all look like you have happy faces. Maybe someone has never, here today, has never given your heart to Jesus in a meaningful way. Maybe you haven't done that, haven't had the opportunity. I want to give you that opportunity this morning to say yes in your heart. I'm not going to have anybody raise their hands or anything like that. In your heart of hearts. And... Uh, your loyalty to him who is holy and unselfish beyond comprehension. And you might like to be baptized and join with Christ's body. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it?
we are his mouthpiece. We are our hands and legs. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a book written and published by the Pacific Press some, some years ago, The Gospel in Shoes. What do you think that's all about? <laughs> Somebody wearing out his shoes, telling the love of Jesus to other people. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So maybe somebody here would like to make that kind of a commitment today in your heart. He sees you. Please, there's a little piece of paper in the pew in front of you. If that's your desire, write it down and, and give it to one of the elders or somebody here, and I'll get a hold of it. And we will make a, a provision for you to, to join with God's people who keep his commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Yes, it's only, it's only the unselfish Jesus 